Episode five of Eyes on Liberty is with Brandon Quittum. He's a popular Bitcoiner for his writing and speaking, and he's also the VP of revenue for Swan Bitcoin. He has the ability to bridge the esoteric with the elemental when he communicates. He can truly make daunting ideas simplified for the general audience. Now, speaking of which, in this episode, we take on the somewhat weighty topics of the fourth turning and the potential fragmentation of too big to fail nation states on a hard money standard. Now, you think we can cover these topics in depth in only 60 minutes? Hell to the no. <laughs> so we'll bring him back in the future, but you don't want to miss what will hopefully be one of many talks with Mr. Brandon Quittum. You find those who have not had freedom uh, and not in a position to define freedom, they're beginning to define it for themselves now. And as they get in a position intellectually to define freedom for themselves, they see that they don't have it. And it makes them less peaceful. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice. Monetary debasement is out of control. Runaway debt like an animated snowball. The only question is, do you want to take the steps to get out of the way? Or do you become a casualty to parasitic greed? Brandon, man, uh, it's been a while since I, we last talked, but I'm happy to have you on the show. How are you today, man? I'm doing great. Looking forward to this one. And it uh, sounds like we'll see you in L.A. in a couple of weeks for L.A. Bitcoin Week. Mm -hmm. Or should I say you? You'll, I'll see you in LA. This is my hometown, man. Come on, <laughs> you're visiting me. Um, That's right. And you know, it's funny. I, you know, Corey is always hinting at one day we'll have this, you know, Bitcoin basketball game, and we'll get all the Bitcoiners to play. You, you know, you played high school basketball. You're six four yourself. Uh, when's the last time you picked up a ball? Well, I've got a two year old son, and I shoot hoops in the driveway with him every single day. Um, but it's a little plastic, like you know, three four foot tall Fisher Price one. And I play with a small ball because the big ball doesn't even fit. But I'm draining them from the NBA line now. And uh, I've been just screwing around. I hit a shot. I'd be like, Drano! <laughs> and just like messing with my son pretty much. Now he'll go up there and dunk a ball and say, Drano! And run um, around pumping his chest in the driveway. <laughs> that's too good. No, no. Train him up early. So he, so when he's 14, 15 years old, he's like light years ahead of everyone else. Good job, man. Um, well, I have an hour. <clears throat> I have an hour with you. There's so many things I want to talk to you about. Um, first of all, you're my former co-worker lead for a little bit um, before, you know, the, the swan having, which I call uh, lovingly. Um, also, you have been an inspiration to some of my writings in the past. So we want to get to that as well. But first, um, you know, you were you visited L.A., um, early in the year, I think February, you were interviewed by a fellow Swan, Dan Ripple, and you guys just started talk, just started riffing about things that money touches. Um, you know, it started riffing on you know your mycelium theory, um, Bitcoin as a pioneer species, but then you talked about something that really stood out to me. I had the privilege to introduce you guys, and you talked about how basically on a hard money system that these overbloated government um, entities, the Russias, the Chinas, the United States, um, where you would think that they, in this world, in this fiat world, they become too big to fail, but in a hard money world, they would potentially be too big to succeed. Um, it was a blur and it was like, I was just like ear to ear smiles. You mind kind of breaking down your perspective of how hard money affects uh, government institutions? Yeah, absolutely. So this is a big one. Um, essentially, we found ourselves today at the, I would say, past the industrial age, a couple decades into the information age, in a really weird place because our institutions, our governments, our structures that we hold society together, were all formed in the industrial age. In the industrial age, the incentives were, were around 
how much magnitude of force can you muster? How many people do you have? How many machines do you have? How many ships do you have? Um, can you control the, the global seas with more ships, uh, more firepower, more output, et cetera? And in the information age, the, the logic of how we organize uh, changes. And I think we're just starting to come to terms with that change. And so these thoughts are essentially putting my hat on, my thinking cap on, looking to the future and say, if these trends continue, how would it disrupt the way we organize as a species? And so I'll lay out some of these ideas, but the meta point here is that I think we're going to fracture into maybe 10 or 100 X as many nation states. So we have like what, two, 280, three, let's just call it 300 countries today. I think it will be closer to 3000 in 50 years or 100 years, um, however long that takes. And the reason is in the information age, all the incentives change. So now instead of having this giant population where most workers are not so useful anymore, uh, because we're going to we don't need labor to farm. We don't need labor to build things. And so you can you can get by with way fewer individual humans. So more doesn't necessarily mean better. Um, a lot of the work has shifted online into a, a more service based economy. Um, we have global Wi-Fi, we have encrypted communication, we have encrypted money uh, on the horizon with Bitcoin. You start to add all these things together. You also have uh, autonomous defense systems on the horizon. So uh, it's very cheap to produce drones. The software will not be too expensive either, I assume. So a small city state could defend themselves. They can be high economic output. Um, we can also have, um, let's fast forward to like some new energy systems, like a small modular reactor type direction for nuclear, where it's small for, let's say, 200,000 people, something like that. So you start to add all these things up and it's not too hard to, to squint in the future and see a world where smaller city states are more effective. Um, so that's like prerequisites. On the other side, we have a fracturing globe right now. Uh, which feels like populism. You have right populism, you have left populism, but no matter where you look, there's social unrest around the world. And I think um, that incentive is essentially, do the governments we have today actually reflect the wills of the people? And I think the larger the nation state you are, the, the more that, that, uh, that disconnect is apparent. Whereas if you look at a country like Singapore, uh, small country, relatively homogenous points of view, and very, very successful. Um, and so I think that would be an example of what we could see in the future. Um, I also think there's this interesting point where we haven't really come up with new experiments in government in a very long time. The land's all bought up. So you have Dubai, you have Singapore, you have a few others, but very few. And so I, I want to be cautious that my forecasting the future or whatever we call this isn't tainted by what I want to see because it's certainly true that I want to see uh, smaller nation states more reflective of their people. And so let's just keep that caveat in the back of our minds. Um, yeah, I'd say that's probably the starting point. We can go into different angles here as you see fit. I, I, I do have a few angles. First of all, um, I think I, I vibe with you there. I do kind of want to see that. Um, I think people just from living in the United States, you know, you could, you can hear, you know, Texas saying they want to secede. You could hear California saying they want us to secede. Florida, everyone, every state thinks that they can uh, operate in this fiat world um, by themselves in sort of a smaller, um, smaller uh, manifestation or existence. But then you look at countries with the highest net worth per capita, uh, or as to say net income per capita, or net or GDP per capita, and you start looking at Singapore and Luxembourg are always on the top of the list. Of course, the United States is there, but we own the money system. But then you start seeing Ireland, you start seeing um, Monaco, and these places are obviously famous for, or Switzerland, famous for wealthy people, but it's also famous for its wealthy people, including a high, high standard of living. And it's not a, it's the, the wealth gap isn't so extreme. You're going to have rich people everywhere, but then you have these, these smaller nations are able to be a little more um, focused on the incentives of their small population and work out there, even in a government, even where the government is essentially stealing, you're essentially stealing less 
from fewer people. Um, the government can serve you better because you're closer to the to the unit. The whole is closer to the individual unit. So now I'm thinking, and now I was thinking about asking about militaries. You know, we always talk about militaries. They're so important to to hold your ground. Otherwise, you're too small. You'll just get eaten up. But then, of course, the software, the software, the drones, uh, military will become autonomous uh, and more autonomous in the future, as we've already seen it happening today. So. My question is, what is going to, what are the incentives to fight that future? If everyone's going to be prosperous, if everyone's going to be better off, certainly someone won't be better off by the fragmenting. Who are those people? Can we identify them now? Yeah. So I, if we're thinking about winners and losers, I think the easy one is, well, okay. Any change, any transition, there are winners and losers, right? So the transitionary period, let's just take that aside because that's a temporary period. But if we can just fast forward to 3000 countries instead of 300, who are the winners and losers? Um, I think there's probably some industries that are just going to be losers in that world. Potentially. I don't even know what those are. But I think the primary winners are the people because their governments will reflect the will of their people a little bit better than they do now. Uh, and so you're when you say people, you're talking about more of like the 90 percent or the 95 percent. Yeah. Right. OK. Yes. Um, the, the average person in any country today should be better suited or at least their desires more reflected uh, by the by the governments. Um, this also implies a world where there is the ability for people to leave. Right. And so that one's harder to suss out like how mobile is the world with 3000 governments can you say i don't like this one i'm going to go to the city state next door is it as easy as getting your car and drive there if like the us might be with states if you're talking about true, jurisdictional arbitrage yes and so it's like i mean france you say you don't like france or even if france is broken up into 10 or let's just say five five regions that are now new france a b c d e you don't like New France A, you drive to New New France B. That's right. I, I foresee that being the logical next step of how we organize. And I think the losers are are globalists, imperialists, neocons, whatever you like, the Washington blob. Anyone with that type of ambition, uh, they have a harder time in the new world. So I think that just levels the playing field generally and, and creates more symmetry between individual and state. I think that's a positive thing. A lot um, of the people that you mentioned, yeah. though, just now, the globalists, the neo neocons of Washington blob, I've never heard of that term. But it's, it, I can understand what you're it's uh, what Trump may call the swamp. Uh, exactly. um, but I don't know what a, the a leftist would would essentially call it. But the blob, let's just call it the blob for right now. And. A lot of these people, this government uh, feedback loop, this government, I, I, I'll call it a swamp blob, they are living off of off of coercion and manipulation, uh, the money printer, and they're essentially not creating any value. And I've, I've mentioned this before where it's like, hey, if a government really wants to create value, uh, do they, if they were just doing all the things they're doing, but then selling t-shirts to be profitable, uh, T theoretically, they'd be more value. They, they create more value that way than if they're just in this current state. Like they're not participating in the economy. Therefore, they're forcing people to. They're not participating in a value-added way. They're forcing people to say, "You must work with us," and that's in the form of taxation or contributing to programs that you didn't sign up for. Um, so, are you saying essentially that the world in three thousand nations becomes? closer to, I don't want to say anarcho-capitalist, but more voluntarist or minarchist? Uh, not clear to me. I think that there's probably, my, my, my assessment here is there'd be a very wide range of different types of governments. If you want a everyone's equal or as close to that as possible type state with extremely high taxes and lots of levers to redistribute wealth, you can go choose that place. And if it's popular, the country grows and it becomes more powerful. But I don't believe that's a very effective type of city state. So I think that in reality, it would be outcompeted by a more meritocratic type location. Um, and so that's how I see that. I, with your points to the, the blob or the parasitic class, very true. Um, not only do they, they add little to no value to us uh, as individual citizens, 
Like we don't even have a border, et cetera. Um, they're, they're stealing from us, right? At least the taxes are known. We, if you see the number, it comes out, you know, the tax is too much. I don't like that. But the inflation tax, which is just a, a shadow tax, it's, it's slippery. You can't put your finger on it. The average person feels they're getting poorer, but we don't see the number. We didn't vote this. It's not in our control. That's the one that really pisses me off because it funds their operations and we don't have a say in the matter. So I would expect a world where if we can leave our jurisdiction, I can drive across the border to Wisconsin in 30 minutes if I don't like my, my government. Um, that forces the government to be uh, in alignment with their citizens in the same way that if you mismanage the monetary system in my country, I will move all my assets into Bitcoin, which is not going to go down the ship with your mismanaged monetary policy. And so, again, it's just about getting more skin in the game, a tighter feedback loop with state and individual. And I think that's not some like crazy anarchist world. That's a sane world. That's a more powerful, more efficient more popular, more successful world, honestly. Um, it's something we should look forward to. And now if someone's like, hey, we're never going to do that succession. You guys are crazy. Okay, let's pull out a, a poll. From 2021, 37% of Americans indicated a willingness to secede. That's in 2021. What do you think the number is now? You think it went up or down? <laughs> It may. I mean, I, I think everyone wants to secede from everyone. That's the funny exactly. thing. Like, every, like we're literally on the on the precipice of a civil war. If there wasn't like this propensity to be nice to each other uh, in sort of a fake way, you know, it's like no one really wants to say the quiet parts out loud. We're not. This country is not aligned, and we try. We the politicians try to say we're all t we're all together and that i think that's the populist uh dynamic like everyone thinks like us not necessarily um and w w you know what you did say you said that people could leave as they as they wanted to and in fact i think we see in el salvador already like they are begging what would you call it innovators entrepreneurs builders to to come there they're incentivizing you to become a citizen there so they can build their Bitcoin economy. And I just feel like what you're what you're saying, not only would countries work with each other with with their citizens, but they would also market and and appeal to citizens, try to give them incentive. You come to country one, two, three, four, or five and leave country 55, 55 alone. We have your back and we'll give you this incentive to be here. And where countries now coerce and say, pay this or die, pay this or go to prison. Then it's, if you come here, we'll give you this benefit. So people are like, you know, oh, let's flip the catalog to figure out where exactly should we spend our next 10 years? And that's, um, I think that's a very alien world that compared to what we live in now, which is sad because we're supposed to be more free than we were 300 years ago. And really, people are all just kind of uh, committed to this slave, this kind of veiled slave uh, existence. Um, do you see countries being more like a more like a business propositions to um, to their to their potential citizens? Yes, exactly. They, they should be winning our favor. They should be fighting for our productivity in their tax jurisdiction. Right now, we don't have a way to get out. And so we're all tax cattle. We can be abused and we don't really have much say in the matter. Um, however, in a world where I think El Salvador is a great example, by the way, um, in a world where El Salvador makes radical changes and they see the quality of life go up, opportunities go up locally. What happened? OK, murder capital of the world where for a decade or two, all the people who could fled because they were smart and they wanted a better life. Now what's happening? conditions improved in El Salvador, the El Salvadorian diaspora is now returning to their home country because the opportunities are better there. That's a trend that all of a sudden makes huge dividends for a small country like El Salvador. And I think we're already starting to see countries competing for population, right? It, you can look at the digital nomad movement. You can look at the golden passport movement meaning go to El Salvador, pay three Bitcoin, get a, get a passport. 
go to Portugal, start a business, hire six people, get a passport, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is going to continue to grow because if you want to grow your nation state and you can just say, hey, I have a jurisdiction that's attractive. Come come bring your productivity here. You better believe the upstart nations are going to do that. They already are. It's going to continue. Yes. So rumbling is Balaji, right? He's got his network state thesis which is essentially an internet native way to fracture into 3000 countries where we organize online first. We're all Bitcoiners, we're all club salamanders, whatever, we all like salamanders. And we all get together online and talk about our favorite salamanders. And then one day we decide to organize because we all want to get together and uh, we just view a world with lots more amphibians. And so then we go, <laughs> by Southern Florida and we, you know, we have a, a very amphibious life. Obviously that's a silly example, but point being, you start online, you organize, you create customs, norms, social, you feel like there's a community, then eventually you get the geography later. And so these are just little rumblings. I don't know how long it's gonna take, probably longer than I think, as most things do. Um, and then one more point just to hammer home, you, you, meant, you said something very profound earlier, which is that, we we want to get a, we want to secede from everyone essentially pointing out that we're very fractured as a population entirely true and what i see right now is that both sides feel that the world and the decisions we make let's say in the presidential election in a couple of months here both sides believe that if the other side wins it could be the end of our country okay so there's this climate of existential angst over the future and the, yeah, the crazy part is both sides believe the exact same thing about each other. That type of condition is so damaging to a population. Um, it's like just looking at what happened when Trump was president during COVID, just destroying families based on political lines. And how sad is that? Like, it, to me, that's so despicable. I can't even imagine. And those who are involved in creating or promoting or amplifying whatever you want to say the type of division that led to families breaking up over some political issues that's unforgivable to me i think that's going to continue um it it also puts our entire country in a scary place because um okay trump almost was assassinated second attempt whatever if he would have been actually assassinated I don't know what would have happened, but I wouldn't be surprised if cities were burning in 30 days. Um, it, it wouldn't surprise me if there's a close election in November and it's contested. Wouldn't surprise me if it spirals. Uh, we're a powder keg right now, and that's terrifying. We also have some. Anyways, that stuff's terrifying. And if we break out into some sort hold of. Hold on, hold on, hold on. You can't just say, and then we have. Never mind. You can't do that on the on the eyes of liberty. This is free speech. Let's go. What were you going to say? Uh, well, I'm just thinking about how we don't seem to mind that we're walking into a escalation with Russia right now. Mm -hmm. um, it seems that we're undervalued or un we're underestimating the risk of what that would mean. Uh, walking into a, a global hot war, escalating their potential nuclear war, etc. Uh, the fact that that's not front page news is terrifying to me. I don't understand why we believe like we're, we're so arrogant that we don't assign much of a risk there or we're too caught up in the tweets of the day that we can't think about the big picture. I don't know what it is, but I think it's a combination of that. Yeah. When you think about the, the strength of the media, I mean, when you think about the Trump assassination, and again, I'm not trying to go down like some political path, but just the idea that a, a past president, potential new candidate, uh, was shot in the ear, and some people say it's a hoax, whatever. Um, I don't think so. Someone died out there. So um, the idea that someone was shot, and then essentially a month later, if not even two two weeks later, it was a non-story. And I think the media has become so um, infested or or saturated with noise that we can't really pull back into what the important stories are and so much noise that even the big stories that are far from us uh that they can be easily hidden and i think one of those is the russian ukraine war and essentially it's a russia nato war um and the idea that we as americans don't really care about if that continues on because i guess it's so far away 
Um, and if it were to even come to a hot war, I think the egotism is that, well, it's okay because 3,000 miles away. Uh, the lack of care for your neighbor or for uh, your fellow human uh, is something that seems to be a brainwashed kind of dynamic with the with too much media. And I'm not going to say we all have the right to consume as many video games or Twitter or tweets as we want, but the idea is, uh, are we self-regulating ourselves and at what cost? Uh, and so that, I mean, that's my monologue on that note, but I didn't mean to cut you off, but I think it's very scary to see that we can essentially be, we can ignore um, a very diabolical and potentially serious, increasingly serious war um, for nothing. Yeah, it's sad. It, it doesn't lend confidence to the future. And w- what's frustrating to me is we do have the chance for an American resurgence here. We really do. We have the natural resources. We have the food, the water. We're the most defensible country, relatively speaking. We still have strong demographics compared to other developed nations. We're not perfect, but we're, we're decent. You're talking about growth rate, like birth rate or something, right? Yes. What are you talking about uh, demographics or age age range? Both. Yeah, okay. both the birth rate, which is below replacement rate, to be fair, but not as bad as other countries, but also uh, the population, right? So if you look at demography, they create like a – a chart and based on the age is like your, is your boomer cohort really big or really small? Are your young people big or small, right? You don't want a demographic chart where old, there's more old people than young people because Japan. young people are productive, old people yeah. draw their, their negative productivity. And so you want to have an even balance as much as possible. And otherwise you have a deflationary spiral like Japan and it's, it's not a good situation. And so globally right now, we're dealing with a population collapse risk, not a overpopulation risk. Um, And I'm just saying America relative to other developing nations is still decently strong. We need we have work to do. We need to make more babies. But uh, compared to our peers, we're okay. Like Western Europe's way worse. South Korea, way worse. Japan, way worse, et cetera. China off the charts bad. And so we have a strong position here. If we can get aligned as a population and one thing I've noticed over the last three, 400 years looking at history is that uh, America has gone through cycles. And depending on the period we're in, we, we actually are in a, a slightly different implementation of our republic. Are our institutions strong? Are individual states strong? Right? There's all these different levers you can look at. And roughly every 80 to 90 years, we reinvent our, our version of Americans' republic. And I think we're going through the same process right now. And I think we are on sort of a knife's edge between a weird uh, techno communist AI globalist kind of just like mass censorship, the AI overlord kind of just like more like what China is going that direction. Or we can go the opposite way towards a little bit more OG American values, distribution of power, meritocracy apparently that's a bad word now um individual liberties like competition uh that type of america that we were built on where all of our success came from and so to me it's quite obvious the direction we want to fall but i think that the average person feels fear about the direction of the country and in a period where you're scared of the future you give up your liberties for security And so I think there's a collective vibe right now where people are willing to do things that are crazy 10 years ago. They're willing to make sacrifices they wouldn't normally make because they view the future as existential, right? Why would the Democratic Party believe that they need to uh, prop up a candidate with no votes and uh, control the media, do lawfare, try to get Trump kicked out? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, in order to save democracy, like the position is, we need to be an authoritarian regime in order to prevent mm-hmm. Donald Trump from ruining democracy, right? Like the lo- tortured logic you have to have to come with that in your head has to be so existentially fearful that you're willing to say the best option is to be an authoritarian in order to save democracy, right? That's or- the only way this can make sense in my head. You know, there's another there's another way is that where they and again, I'm harping back onto the media where there is there's such a confident 
control over the media and their ability to control the narrative that they can literally change the definition of a word. <laughs> and so I haven't gone back to listen to this again, but Eric Weinstein uh, had an interview with, don't know the gentleman, but he started breaking down um, in a much better way than I could um, the difference between democracy and democracy. And it's one that you're talking about. And two, it's the uh, the one that's the what's going on. This is crazy. And two is the other one that we were kind of found, uh, founded on, but it's more in relationship to that constitutional protection of, of individual liberties. And if we're going to be in this collective, then we're at least going to let everyone get their voice heard in an appropriate way. And so there's that. And then probably more of the democracy that was pushed onto Europe maybe after World War I. Uh, with Woodrow Wilson. And so it's like, these are the kind of things that same word, um, drastically different definitions. Uh, and it's easy that that kind of narrative, and you would hear not only the left wing, uh, but also the right wing people, they also say, you know, we want to defend our democracy in a different way. But they always use this term democracy, I think they're using it in the in a consensus way. It's just as not in consensus with the normal 90%, 95% of people that are listening to them because they're thinking about the democracy that, you know, George Washington fought for. Um, have you noticed, do you have a, do you have a definition of what they mean by democracy when they say it? Yeah, I don't, I don't have a, here's the definition that I think they're using, Trick. but I think yeah. they're using that term as a tool they're using it as a way to say, well, if you're not for democracy, then you're evil. And democracy, Donald Trump's not for democracy. So if you want to save democracy, you got to vote for the authoritarian uh, shadow state that propped up uh, Kamala. And so in my view, it's like they're just using it in a way that you can't be against it. There's no way to be against it. Right. And it's a form of propaganda. That's what it is. And it, you can look up a famous example. I'll share one from uh, Edward Bernays, who is Sigmund Freud's cousin. He's the father of propaganda. Okay, in the early 1900s, he's this dude's around, and or maybe this was in the 50s actually. I mean, this was in the 50s. The ad agencies go to this PR expert, Edward Bernays. He he invented uh, public relations, aka propaganda. The, the cigarette companies go to this genius ad guy and say, "Hey, dude." All the guys smoke cigarettes, but none of the women do. How do we get the women to smoke cigarettes? So he analyzes cigarettes from a psychology standpoint. What does it mean? Okay, it's kind of a independence. It's a power thing. It's a very masculine, independent kind of, that's the association with it. So you have to convince women that uh, they should smoke cigarettes and that's the frame you wanna use. So he created this PR stunt in the May Macy's Day Parade, Thanksgiving Macy's Day Parade in New York City. He hired a bunch of prominent women at whatever the time was, 11-11. All the women stand up and they all smoke a cigarette loudly and proudly in front of the public, which would be a weird thing. So whatever. He also seeded all the media in the whole world with the headline for him. Here's the story. Here's the press release. Right. He shipped it like send a mass email in the 50s essentially updating all the press people and he created the slogan torches of freedom okay so now you have all these independent women smoking torches of freedom and that's the slogan across the whole world and then what how are you going to be against freedom you can't be against freedom in america so no you essentially leverage the words as a weapon and make yourself indefensible what happened Women went from like 5% to like 30, 40, 50% of the customers from that one incident. And I view that our government is playing the same way by saying our democracy is at risk. And honestly, both sides are playing the same game, um, to be entirely fair. I, I would side with the right on this one because um, what's happening in the Democratic Party right now, prop up a uh, weekend at Bernie's substitute them out like the permanent state is running the ship over there at least on the right you can disagree with opinions and tact and whatever but at least the primary uh, process occurred votes were cast the will of the people is at least being propped up 
in some sort of normal sense. And so um, anyways, it's propaganda everywhere you look and words are weapons and we should be very skeptical of how things are used. And we should all be very skeptical of what we're consuming and how it affects us. And when we're scrolling, is that an objective view of reality? Is that an algorithm feeding us outrage? What's going on? We should think very hard uh, about what we're consuming and how it affects us. At the same time, I don't think it's in our best interest to try to scroll harder and like try and figure it all out. I think it's actually bad for us individually in our biology. Um, personal story, slight tangent here. During COVID, I was getting kind of frustrated. Um, I live in Minneapolis, city's burning, you know, social stuff is all shut down. That was the George, um, George Floyd city, right? Yep. Happened on my birthday. Oh, my um, God. Two, three miles from my house at the time. Uh, very, very crazy time. But post that, I was like kind of bummed out. Like, what's going on? I was wrapped up in all the stuff going on, trying to understand it. I was listening to a, a podcast. It was actually a John Vallis Hoddle Hang podcast with Breedlove, Kaysen, Hoddle, Vallis. And I had this moment. I was like working out in a park with headphones on, whatever. I'll never forget the moment though, because I went from black pill, everything's messed up to, wait a minute. If the worst case scenario happens, I buy a one-way ticket with my wife. We take whatever we need. We have all our Bitcoin. We start over someone else. I'm capable. She's capable. We can navigate the world. Worst case scenario is I just buy a one-way ticket somewhere and I keep going. There's no problem. And I had this like sense of calm confidence wash over me like, Hey, do not let the big bad things in the world ruin your day because I was truly letting it affect me. And I would say since then, I've been on the white pill train. Like, do not allow what's happening in another country to ruin your day to day. When I finish work, go upstairs and play with my two year old son. Am I really going to bring the bullshit I read on Twitter into that engagement and taint his innocent mind? That's crazy. When I look around, my life is great. My neighbors are fine. And I think for most people, I mean, I don't want to minimize the economic challenges or otherwise, but like most people are allowing the internet to negatively affect their life in a way that's not warranted. So that whole rant is to say, don't let the internet uh, rain on your parade, uh, be optimistic, build your local community. That's actually what matters most here. And uh, I think we'll all be happier and healthier with that type of world. And maybe you notice that your neighbor who's got the opposite political slogan in their front yard, maybe when you go borrow their snow shovel one day, you realize that they're a pretty normal person. And instead of the caricatures displayed to you on your Twitter feed, um, they're a normal person with slightly different views on probably like 10% of the issues, 90% you're lying, 10% you're not. And yet you caricaturize each other. So essentially touch grass. That's, that's, that's a takeaway on that one. That, that's great. And I mean, there's so many points that, that I would want to tug on that I, I get lost. I can see why people have three hour podcasts because there's, then you can talk about everything. Um, especially all the brilliant things that you brought up. I do want to pull back on one of the earlier points because you kind of made this tangent where you're talking about these 80 year generational cycles. Um, that was written in a book called the fourth turning, by oh, what's his name i forget his name Roe or how i forget there are two authors but i digress you have been you have made your own thoughts on that and you provided some uh in in this uh on this format in this podcast but there's one thing i've always tugged on me with the fourth turning i feel like it's very uh western centric in that the major events in the past fourth turnings was American Revolutionary War, the Americans, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, the American Revolutionary War, the American Civil War, uh, World War One and Two, kind of combined with Hitler. Um, my question to you is, what about Peru? You know, what about Nigeria? You know, if we're on this generational cycle, is this generational cycle, was this sort of made in kind of this Western kind of bubble and then expanded as we became more global or, and those other countries, China and Japan and South America got engulfed in, cause I'm pretty sure whatever happens in America now 
will impact the rest of the world and whatever happens in Europe impacts I mean, Japan changed their rates of 25 BPS and we thought we were going to have the Great Depression part two. So it's like I imagine that everything is kind of in that same bubble now. But what about those times before? How did how did those other countries um, fit into that to that generational cycle? Yeah, great question. Um, so super high level. Fourth Turning is a book written in 97 uh, by Bill Strauss and Neil Howe. Um, it was they've written a couple books together prior. These are historians or demographers studying uh, just literally studying generational cohorts. Their, their first book, Generations, was wildly popular. Or their first popular book was called Generations. They just studied cohorts of people. And out of that book, they accidentally in, in cover, uh, discovered an 80 to 90 year cycle. They didn't want to find it. They, it was slapped in their face. Okay. Then they wrote a specific book about the fourth turning cycle, that generational cycle, which became really popular. And in that book, they discovered that there's for some reason, a roughly 80 to 90 year cycle at the end of that cycle, uh, at least in America, there's been a global uh, or sorry, a hot war, whether that's abroad or a civil war. So the previous one was a period between 1929 and 1945. So Great Depression, stock market collapse, World War II and sort of the wrap up there. Prior to that was the uh, Civil War, prior to that the Revolutionary War. And those also mark the changes between the different republics I mentioned earlier. Radical changes to our institutions every single time this occurs. Okay, I'll, I'll go through a full cycle to illustrate in a second. But how is that possible? Are we looking for patterns that don't exist? Is this doomerism? Is this like horoscopes for intellectuals? And I, I want to kind of dispel some of that. I think it's the right instinct to start with. But the more I spent time with the material, the more clear that this just appears to be an innate cycle that occurs with uh, social species such as us. And I believe the fundamental thing is that we are a complex adaptive system. Society is. This is not some linear logical thing. Um, this is a system with small incentives that change. And um, it's not easy to predict the, the outcomes of introducing new variables, right? It's a complex system in the technical sense. And what it, what it appears to be is that 80 to 90 years, right? One human life. What that means is that why do we go to war every 80, 90 years? Because no we one's forgot. alive. We forgot there. how bad it was. That's exactly. Right. So we lull ourselves into war, right? Why, why are we lackadaisical about escalations with Ukraine and Russia? Why are we lackadaisical about Taiwan, about the Middle East, about uh, rising tensions here? It's because no one was alive last time. We don't remember how bad it was, okay? So it's a very human thing. Another part of the cycle is that the author observed four uh, quadrants or turnings in the full cycle. OK, this is essentially the generations. So generations are 20 to 25 years between each one. Um, the transition points aren't necessarily black and white, but there, there's a clear transition. And then the question is, how does a generation exist? Well, people all born during a certain period of time. OK, we're millennials. We grew up in the 90s and aughts, whatever, 80s, 90s, aughts. In that period, the society which we grew up in was relatively similar. So we all had relatively similar upbringings, at least from a culture side. And what does that mean? That culture that we were raised in, the context we were raised in, imprints us a way of life. It forges our influences, blah, blah, blah. And then we leave the nest. 15 to 20, we leave our parents and we, we go out in the world and we're surrounded by peers only. That, that period right after leaving the nest, where we're only with our peers, that forges our cultural identity as a cohort. We become each other. We're, we're wrapped up. And then forever, that cohort is defined and we have predictive characteristics. We have predictive hopes, fears, dreams. We respond to catalysts in a predictive way, not individually, but as a group we do. Then you can start to stereotype and uh, define these groups. And then you start to say, OK, so every 20, 25 years, a new cohort's defined. And then you start to look at stages of life. Below age 20, you're a child. You're not really influencing the world. You're being influenced. 
Then as a, then the next stage, let's say 20 to 40, you start to go out in the world. You start to change the world. You have radical ideas and you're pushing them out there. Then the 40 to 60, you have peak power. You're the managerial class. You have most of the power. Then you become an elder and you're sort of just providing wisdom, right? So those four things. So now you have different types of generations and different stages of life, four of each. And then you can say in this 80 year cycle, the constellation of which generations at which age, uh, that defines the mood out of the time. So that is, that is the thesis. Is the hero archetype, do they have the power or are they the young people? Is the profit archetype, are they, what, what age are they at, right? And that balance of those archetypes creates the mood. And if we go back from 1945 until, uh, or sorry, 1929 until today, we can do a quick cycle. So the previous fourth turning, stock market crash, 1929, uh, crazy changes to society, eventually World War II. Okay, what happened there? We we did all the stuff that was previously impossible or crazy. Uh, communism and fascism were both becoming popular in the U.S. We weren't sure about Western liberal democracy. We almost threw it out. We started deficit spending for the first time ever. We went to World War II. We created the World Bank, IMF, NATO, um, Bretton Woods, financial system, right? The whole exterior world got totally changed. And after that period of volatility, the post-war era in America was a period of stability. People were sick of fighting, sick of change. They wanted white picket fence, nuclear families, boring culture, you know, rah-rah America. And so we had this period, the first turning, which is defined by stability. It's defined by running away from the chaos of the fourth turning. Okay. Then kids who were born during that period, the baby boomer generation, they grow up, they look around, they say, man, this is so boring. Where's the culture? Where's the sex, drugs, and rock and roll? They push back. They create the civil rights era. They create the psychedelic 60s. They create uh, all the crazy stuff of that period of time and they are pushing back on a vanilla parent generation okay that's a second generation then after that you keep going down that road and you start to create this like a uh, careless lawless crazy situation and then the gen xers they were the kids of that civil rights era so they were underparented, right no institutions screw them do whatever you want Right. And then those kids grow up and the Gen, Gen X kids, society's like, shit, all the kids are messed up or institutions are crumbling. And then you have the next generation born of those parents, the millennials, us. We were overparented, you know, baby on board stickers, um, eighth place ribbons. Right. We're all special. Participation awards. Yeah. yeah. So the, again, the pendulum swung back in the other direction. And then, okay, uh, the third turning is all deregulation. Um, you know, economics are still pretty good, but culture is deteriorating, but no one really wants to solve the problem. Then you have the 08, 09 global financial crisis, which mirrors 1929. That marks a dramatic shift in the culture. And then since uh, 2008, 2009, we've been again in the fourth turning, which I expect for another five, 10 years. And again, this is where things feel existential. We're willing to make massive sacrifice. We do crazy stuff and we would expect the exterior world to be dramatically changed. That midpoint civil rights era, that's changing the interior world. Every second turning for the last 400 years, we had a, a religious uh, revolution. Um, the Protestants, the blah, 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 all those different ones. Same with civil rights era. And then at the end of the cycle is the exterior world, which is what we're doing now. So I expect a radical reimagining of what America's Republic means. Think um, any institution, governments, education, healthcare, media, all those things would be reimagined. No one trusts them, right? They've decayed beyond their useful life and we all collectively feel it. So we're ready to make sacrifice. If you're not with us, you're against us. And that creates very volatile conditions, both abroad and internally. And so that's where we are now. Um, that's a very long preamble. Does this extend internationally or is this a U.S. thing? Very good question. Uh, historically, 
all four turnings have been relatively U.S. based, partially because that's what the author has studied. But I've had conversations with Neil Howe about this specifically, read everything he's ever published and and listen to a lot of his podcasts. So I'm up to date with his thinking. And Neil believes that uh, this will be the first first uh, fourth turning where we're properly globalized. And I entirely agree. We talked about this earlier. There's populism on the left and on the right rising all over. I expect that to continue. Um, does that mean this current fourth turning is a uh, higher risk? I think the answer is yes. I think it means the entire globe is more volatile. I also think that the globe is more fragile. Okay. In a globalized world with just in time supply chains, it doesn't take much of a disruption to have serious problems. If you guys remember COVID, of course you do. You couldn't get toilet paper for a while. Medicine was hard to get. Uh, okay, well, it turns out China is our supplier of a lot of stuff we need. And turns out China is not exactly an ally. So um, I would expect major uh, volatility risk for supply chains, for hot war, for civil war, for pretty much anything bad. I think the risks are accelerating every year. And I really hope it's not some like global hot war, World War Three thing. That sounds pretty bad. Um, if I want to be optimistic for a second, I would say that I think Bitcoin does have a role to play here. I think Bitcoin, uh, essentially what we need to get out of this, this period is new, strong institutions, and we need to figure out what to do with the debt. This is the first fourth turning with a mountain of debt, and that just makes everything harder and it, it makes our margin for error smaller. So again, increasing the, the risk. And so I think Bitcoin serves as a pressure release valve in the system. I think it actually is an institution, a institution for the people of the people type thing where we can say we don't need our governments to do the money anymore. We can own the money as a global population in the same way that like the Internet isn't owned by one country. Uh, I think that would be a good thing for society. I think it's also relieves some pressure off the tension, right, because individuals can save in this neutral asset. Uh, states like El Salvador can save in the neutral asset. And essentially, you can save yourself, which means fewer people are desperate, fewer people are willing to do crazy stuff because locally they're doing okay. And so press release valve there. I also think it plays a role with the debt problem, which again makes countries desperate. And so, yeah, if we're going to be optimistic, uh, we really do want Bitcoin to slowly grow as the old system starts to break down. Um, we'll see how that goes. I don't I don't expect a smooth transition onto the life raft. I don't think that's how things work. Um, right. How, how did you go bankrupt very slowly and then all at once? Mm. Right. This is, how, this is what happens as soon as the momentum flips. It's fast. And so right now it's getting the infrastructure ready to transition and helping as many people as possible uh, see a future where money is out of the hands of government and seeing the benefits of that. And so the slower Bitcoin rises in that sense, the better in my mind. Uh, yeah, that's a whole bunch of thoughts for you there. <laughs> no, no, it, it, it's so funny. Um, yeah, we're going to have to go. For the audience who was expecting to hear Bitcoin as a pioneer species, we're bringing Brandon for part two next time because we're going to dive into this one a little more for the time we have left. Uh, and this is so important because these are the these types of conversations, as well as the pioneer species, which is why you have such a wealth of knowledge and a wealth of per, uh, a vast perspective that's applicable to people who are on the fence, people who are thinking, what do I do with this new technology and how does it apply to the world in which I'm living in, in which I'm interacting in? Some people see Bitcoin as simply a trading game and it's no different than a meme coin. They see, they compare Bitcoin to Doge and it's like, yeah, of course, it's, it's just, it's play money. Even Trump said, you know, go play with your little Bitcoin. Uh, you know, again, he sees us as a, or Bitcoiners as a voting block, not necessarily as this is going to fix all the problems that you don't even know you have or that you choose to ignore because our problems, pe the people's problems are essentially their gravy train. And the people who are very, very politically oriented, uh, even the Libertarian Party, 
uh, the official libertarian party, you know, they just want a shot at the money printer for themselves, as opposed to saying, we need to work out a way to have a society where we don't have a centralized control or a centralized determining factor on what the, what the economy should look like. So I guess my question for you after my little monologue is when people are looking to buy Bitcoin or looking to adopt Bitcoin, are they looking, are they looking at it as a way to save the world? Are they looking at it as a way to save themselves? Are they looking at it as a combination of both? Should they care about saving the world or are we more about if as long as every person cares about saving themselves, the world will take care of it themselves. Do you kind of get where I'm going with that one with that question there? Yeah, great question. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it, the reality is like, OK, let me back up. You go on Twitter, for example, and the TradFi finance bros will be like, why does this Bitcoin thing inspire all these crazy evangelists, these Bitcoin pumpers? This is a cult. This is a bad thing, right? Okay, let's let's dissect this for a second. Um, first of all, it's a good instinct, right? It's the same instinct that that leads people to say, "Hey, man, you're evangelizing Bitcoin so hard. It sounds like a cult. Sounds skeptical. I'm not buying this thing. I'm not taking your orange fill, right?" So we we have this innate aversion to culty stuff. It's built into our hardware for good reason. So Bitcoin offends this side of us on the trad fibro side and on the like. You just try to convince your friend to buy Bitcoin. Um, but let, let's break it down because it's way more interesting than that under the hood. Um, what's happening here is that people adopt Bitcoin to get rich, period. 99% of people, that's why they first bought it. That's going to continue in the future. Yep, myself included. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. You take a risk. If you pay off, you get paid. That's how life is. This is a good thing. It's the same with choosing your career. It's the same with... Um, choosing your partner. It's the same with choosing where you live. We're always making choices to hopefully make our future better. And in a, in a society, we want individuals to make these choices as best as they possibly can with the information they have in their local environment. That's the whole point of a market. That's the whole point of a society is allow individuals to make decisions because at the distributed level, I know what's best for my family. I also know what to buy and what not to buy and my choices impact the price, right? So it's just, that is how society is effective. So with Bitcoin, we try to get rich. Then we realize that, oh shit, there's something more here. If this thing works, there's a bunch of positive externalities that actually make the whole world better, right? So Bitcoin actually turns greed into freedom or greed into prosperity, however you want to look at it. So we should go confidently into this thing. And if we do, great. And what will happen? The people who are early to Bitcoin, the people who took the risk early on will be rewarded and get paid and uh, control a larger share of, of capital in the world. What does that mean? The capital allocators start to shift, right? The old game was who can control the monetary system, who can capture politics to have unfair influence. Those people make decisions today. Well, what happens if all the Bitcoin people who are internet native, took a risk, support freedom, sovereignty, entirely different value system, requires proof of work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If those folks are allocating capital, you better believe the world's going to look a lot different. Um, That money is going to be spent differently because the people who control it have different values. That's and I want I I want to cut you off right there because there's something there's something important to that nature. If the people who control the capital are Bitcoiners, that would imply also that likely the capital um, it, intrinsically or natively is Bitcoin, that we we move to this unit of account that is Bitcoin, hyper Bitcoinization, whether it's the base layer or the only layer um, or all the layers are denominated in Bitcoin. Um, and so what you have here is now the people who their whole incentive to get to the top of a political ladder, um, politics becomes much less of a of a deciding factor where it's like a presidential election won't m- be a make or break. Oh my gosh, am I going to die? Am I not going to die? Do I have to leave or start a war if the other person gets elected? All of a sudden, the presidential election could be as 
consequential as almost a mayor election or who runs this, the, the, the local PTA um, because we have value creators driving society. And guess what? If they're creating value for themselves, they're likely creating value for other people. And the people who create the most value, they're like, yeah, of course I would want that person to be in charge. He does something good for me. Of course I want that person in charge. That person does good for me too. They should have the deciding factors in how society is working. And it shows but because of their value creation. So it completely moves the the script for getting ahead in life is that, Hey, you want to get ahead a lot in life proof of work actually build something great. So I'm, I'm sorry to, you know, interrupt you for that one, but I think that one needed to be said. It's very, very important um, comparison between now and hopefully what's in that next generational cycle. Um, Yeah. I'm sorry. I I cut you. No, no, that's great. I mean, let me add to that. I think it's a profound point. Um, we care about politics right now because the government plays an, an unusually large role in our daily lives. It's the largest employer in the world. Our social programs are enormous. Um, some amount of this is good, by the way, but it's gotten way too big. It needs to be cleaned out. And so, yeah, you essentially have too many people uh, absorbed by the government's influence that elections matter more than they should. Um, the reality is values created from people, individuals, entrepreneurs who form companies and groups and change the world. That's where value is created. The government doesn't create any value. The government at best can defend your, your territory, but there's so much bureaucratic waste that you start to add it all up and it causes, in many cases, more harm than good. So in a world where the money is out of the government, all of a sudden the government's role becomes a little more focused. I'm not anti-state. I'm not anti-government. I'm anti the government. I I want the government to be as small as possible and as focused and efficient as possible with feedback loops more akin to a company rather than this like invincible machine blob that only grows every year, right? The government doesn't remove departments. The government doesn't fire people because their budget's not working. No, 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 no. We just keep going, baby. And it makes sense. The incentives are there. Um, that is the system. That is the incentive. That is obviously what's going to occur. And so if you take the money printer out of the state, that's a huge source of power that they don't deserve. And what will that lead to? It'll create a more free world, less reliance on government, which means more productivity. The elections mean less. And it also means that there's, again, back to the beginning, more symmetry with your government. Right. I would love a government that protected our border and enforced the rules that we agree on and some other basic things. But I don't like a government who says what I can do in my own house or legislates all these social things or whatever. Pick your your pet grievance with the government. Um, I think they have too much power. So let's get rid of that. Um, The next point is a society who depends on social programs and waste. Uh, from government programs is a society that uh, slowly dies uh, because merit is not part of that equation. We've culturally, we've decided that if you're good at something, that's bad. We shouldn't strive for excellence. We shouldn't reward merit. You should be ashamed of merit. That's the, that's the culture we're in right now. Um, that's not the culture that got America to our prosperity. We would be wise to look back at what it took to build such a prosperous nation. And it, and it definitely wasn't social programs and, you know, eighth place ribbons and poor health and all these different things. No, 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 no. It was a meritocratic system. That's what America is. That's how you compete. And we want to reward this because uh, the people who uh, take risk and change the world make the world better for everyone. By creating a new technology, by creating a new type of service, a new whatever, and the risk and the amount of work it takes to pull it off, um, that is what makes the world better. That is how wealth is created. So we need to inspire that, encourage that, foster that, whatever you want to say, rather than try to penalize that and et cetera. Now, that doesn't mean that it's going to be fair that everyone's going to have the same amount. No, that's nonsense. We don't even want that. We want fair rules. We want the starting point is fair. Everyone should have as equal of an opportunity as humanly possible. No matter what you look like, where you're from, normalize all that. Everyone has the same shot. If we can get as close as we can to static fair rules, then the cream will rise to the top 
and they will uh, change the world for the better and we'll all benefit. And in that same world, we don't want to have people starving in our neighborhood. So we do want to have a capacity to uh, help the people who need help. I'm, I'm very much in support of that. But we can't go too far because if you go too far and you erode the culture, then it hurts everyone. So, um, again, take the money out. And that does looks like it will do a lot. It's not going to fix everything. But it, it takes a huge chunk out. And I think downstream of that, we can be optimistic about a world that works honestly for more people, will be more productive, more wealthy, and um, less wrapped up in this political game. And, you know, all of a sudden no one's fighting over the monetary system because you can't capture it. And if you can't capture something, it forces otherwise, uh, otherwise productive people to go do something real rather than just play fiat games, political games to capture the money. And so no matter what, it's net productivity good. Um, waste goes down. Yeah, there's just a downstream effect there that looks extremely positive. Um, you know, it's like, as I'm, there's only one other time where I felt like during my podcast where I felt like I had to take notes because there were things, oh my gosh, like that's, you know, Bitcoin fixes this or it's like he who wants, who he who sacrifices freedom for safety deserves neither. And it's like, I want to say all these things and I just get washed by all the, all the things I want to say, you're essentially saying them. I want to agree with you so vehemently. And I would say the best way I can agree with you is just by bringing you back on another time before the end of the year, uh, because we have some other topics to get to. So a teaser for the audience. I want to talk about the mycelium article that you wrote. That was so brilliant. Bitcoin is a pioneer species, which I, you know you're a good art, a good writer where someone else comes up from behind you and paraphrases and builds upon it. So I wrote a derivative article that was actually what was well received by a lot of people based on your own writings. Uh, so with the time we have left, which is like a few seconds, I want to say thank you for your writings. Thank you for your inspiration. Uh, thank you for being a coworker for nine months. Uh, and just thank you for your contribution to Bitcoin uh, in the time that you've had. You're, you're a brilliant inspiration to many people. Uh, and I look forward to having you on the show again. I appreciate that, man. And right back at you. Um, this Bitcoin thing is weird. It captures you. You become an evangelist. And for many people, I donated a many hours, times, talents, energy to this thing. And um it's an honor to have influenced people in any small way. And it makes me feel really good seeing others um, follow down similar paths or come to similar conclusions with or without my influence. And it kind of feels like as a Bitcoiner, you got to serve your tour of duty once this thing swallows you. And then you pass the torch and hopefully you ride up into the sunset. And yeah, we're all just sort of playing our small role, building this thing that's larger than all of us. And Personally, I found immense satisfaction, purpose, you know, answers to the big questions in life, just trying to build something that I think is good for the world. And um, yeah, you're, you're a part of that. It's been it's been a great pleasure to get to know you. And um, yeah, I, I love watching it and happy to do another one. And I value it. I value our time every every time we get together. So appreciate it, man. Thank you, Brandon. So. Brandon Quidham uh, with me today. Again, he's one of those guys that when I first started writing, I'm reading his stuff. I'm like, well, I got to I gotta say something like this. It's like, this is good. Let me build upon this. this let me build upon that. Um, it was a privilege to to be you know a co-worker of his for the time I, I was. And again, when I first started this podcast, he was one of those guys. I got to get BQ on this show. Thank you for joining me today. I am Sir Ulrich, like my father before me. Tune in next time when I have another brilliant Bitcoin guest. And tune in for part two when I bring up Brandon Quidham uh, very soon in the near future.